the Central Zoo Authority, in collaboration with the Atal Innovation Mission, Niti Aayog, launched Zootopia 2021 in an attempt to involve the young creative minds of our nation in developing an interpretation center for an Indian zoo. The series of webinars and panel discussions with subject matter experts have been planned to spread the importance of zoo design and planning in the field of architecture, planning, design, and also communicate the need and importance of a holistic view and a multidisciplinary approach. Today's sessions are dedicated to understanding closely knit ties that nature and wildlife have and the possibilities and inspiration one can draw while planning conservation and landscape education. We have very five very accomplished speakers for the session today. Ms. Lima Rosalind, who is the director of Green Future Foundation, Mr. Samir Shukla from Pagma Cumulus Consortium, Ms. Komolika Bose from Heritage Synergies, Ms. Dipti from Dharipri, and Ms. Sangeeta Karur from Fenestration. To start the session, I would like to invite Ms. Lima Rosalind, Director of Green Future Foundation. She's a wildlife biologist and an environment educator. She works with school and higher education systems. Her work involves designing conservation education strategies for protected areas and setting up outdoor education facilities, nature trails, wetland education centers, visitor center for national parks, sanctuaries, wetlands, and botanical gardens. Over to you. Thank you, Gauri. I'd like to share my screen. All right. So um, thank you very much for having me here, the CZA, Sonali, and everyone, all my co-speakers. Uh, I would uh, like to talk about interpreting Chilka. Chilka is talk about a one wetland. So Chilka is a lagoon in Orissa and uh, the Chilka Development Authority came to us asking us to interpret Chilka. So uh, <clears throat> what does it mean when you say we want to interpret Chilka? So we said we will develop an integrated strategy for communicating Chilka and how so interpretation in uh, communicating strategy for interpretation, environment education, and communication. All this put together interprets Chilika and its natural resources, its biological resources, its cultural resources. So um, just to give a first-hand information or just to give an introduction to what interpretation is all about, interpretation is communication. You interpret every day. You explain things to your children. You explain things to your teachers. Teachers explain things to kids. So in a sense, we are constantly interpreting ourselves, things around us, things that we do. But it, when you talk of interpretation, the, to communicate uh, as a process, you in, in an interpretation center, then it involves design to reveal meanings, relationship, both for cultural, natural heritage sites, through several artifacts, figures, demonstrations, pictures, models. And as we go through in this presentation, you will see a whole lot of these in different modes. So why interpret? And for whom are you interpreting? You always interpret for somebody. You always, and what are you interpreting? And when you interpret, you use different kinds of media. And how do you design that? How do you develop that? How do you come to a conclusion that this should be it? So why are you interpreting Chilika? For us here, one of the one of the uh, things was okay. Look at Chilika in the context of being the most visited lagoon, uh, freshwater lagoon in Orissa, brackish water lagoon in Orissa, which is home to more than 225 species of fish, reptiles, and you had one of the most exquisite endangered species like the Irrawaddy dolphin. And people come to Chilka to visit the dolphin from all across the world. So it has tremendous potential for ecotourism. People were already visiting it without having an interpretation center to tell them what all Chilka is, what all Chilka has, what its what its wealth is. And also to bring about an awareness of Chilka. When we went in, when we were asked uh, to do this project by the CDA, Chilka was under threat. There was huge siltation, the sinkage of the area, 
the inlet mouth from the sea had choked. They had to ship that mouth and a whole lot of weed infestation. There were drop in fish. The local communities were up in arms and there, there was an overall sense of loss of biodiversity all across. So we felt, uh, as well as the CDA, felt if interpretation can make, can raise awareness among the public and to bring the pressure down, to bring support to the conservation efforts of CDA, is interpretation alternative maybe? And how do we, we went into this looking at how do we make people understand? How do we make friends for Chilka? How do we make, uh, how can we have better understanding of these relationships amongst the stakeholders and the users of the lagoon and of course the surrounding areas? So interpretation also has an understanding, awareness and education. And most of all, developing Chilika as an exciting educational tool, both for children and adults and visitors. So we looked at interpreting all the biodiversity, the wetland ecology, fisheries, the local traditions, the local stakeholders involving all of them. And the whole messaging was built across these uh, literacy levels, across these understanding levels, across stakeholder groups, across all levels of people who would visit the center. To that effect, we created the message media matrix. The message media matrix also will tell you if it can go one step further and also tell you if a design is well within your budget or not, because everything finally is confined to a certain limiting budget. So when you do the message media matrix, you can also add one more column which says, can this design or can biodiversity uh, in this design Will it be feasible? So, so here we have just presented to you the ecotourism awareness understanding levels, and wherever we have the maximum stars, you the wetland ecology can come in the area of understanding. So, therefore, designing that uh, in in whatever form that you want to design that in whatever cost that you want to design that will be a compelling factor, and therefore the message media matrix is very crucial to design any interpretation program. And of course, there's a law, there's a variety of media that available to you when you design uh, for key elements. And of course, the visitor center and an interpretation center can be done uh, not just within a center. It can also be done in the outdoors, like an outdoor education facility. However, with the, with the level of uh, Country, it is uh, it's really not very feasible to have delicate exhibits in the outside and you know leave it to, to the vandals. So uh, one of the some of the media for interpretation at Chilika was visitor centers. We had viewing locations. We had machans. We were thinking uh, you know the machans make an exquisite uh, platform for interpreting birds. You see birds there and you don't know them, so you need to have an interpretative panel where you can identify birds from viewing locations. In boat interpretation, people do a lot of boating in, in Chilka. Can we have uh, interpretation about what they see, the birds, the Iravadi dolphins, etc.? So we also looked at that. Field guides, yes, low cost field guides in the local language, program for stakeholders, program for for community fishers, the fishermen in, in the area, and all the other stakeholders who interact with the lagoon. Camping, we felt, was also an important activity around the lagoon. We had spaces for it, so we also did, uh, did, did mention that and create opportunities for camping. Uh, outside the interpretation center, of course, we had brochures, the press, the school programs. We had programs radiating while we had the interpretation center with its exhibits and everything. We also felt programs radiating out of the center to bring in better stakeholder engagement with the resource. So we also had press interpretation programs of press and the media, school programs where school children were told about Chilka and a day trip to the Chilka interpretation center and a visit to the lagoon and a boating to the lagoon all form part of the program. The other thing that people can take away from the center were sovereignty, specially designed, special programs, 
and of course uh, we used everything from the train route which is closer to chilka to the highway we had the interpretation uh, boards uh, to on the highway these hoardings on the highway just like uh, you know uh, you don't have boarding just for election campaigns and of lead local leaders but also have uh, uh, you know um, uh, for inter for chilka yeah uh well satpara was a center that was built for uh, that is a visitor center for chilka and of course we had a lagoon exhibit with other smaller centers that were also developed as part of this program we had three watchtowers where exhibits were mounted on railing basically these were uh, you know bird charts that were put because of wind conditions i mean if you take a bird book and you go up to the machan you're going to probably the 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 field guide will probably fly off your hand so one of the things that we did in these viewing towers they were to put in these uh, identification boards which were embedded well embedded and of course we said exhibit the jetties and key location these are things that we proposed and things that were they were later implemented yeah i'm not going too much into detail we also developed a look uh, we also developed field guide the local languages program for stakeholders campaign brochures press we also thought we needed better press for cda for the tilka development authority because people really don't know how the lagoon is managed what what people do to create uh, more biodiversity what about the the fish catch that was dropping in what about other other problems that were at that time plaguing chilka so for want of better better press we also created press uh, uh, you know media not only not only training the media people to give us better press but also bringing them in to to actually create an understanding of what goes on in the chilka lagoon to create the lagoon that it is of course uh yeah we also created a small uh, interpretation huts uh, for the local communities where they can come and they can you know meet in the evenings where they can have their uh, you know something like the katta that they do in in maharashtra in the pune area so we also created these small areas within the fishermen colonies where they can come they can uh, you know discuss stuff they can you know we also provided a lot of information about the fish catch the daily fish catch the the species that 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 is relevant for chilka we also created information about what happens to the iravari dolphin which is specifically a fish eater and how the dolphin is really not an enemy for the fishing community and the fishermen there these are certain perception that needed to be changed so interpretation does all of this it creates communication it creates understanding it creates friends it creates partners so technically interpretation is a tool for creating great partnerships for running a, for a for a resource whether it is a wetland whether it is a zoo or a or a, or a national park or a sanctuary or a community conservation area whatever interpretation technically an educational tool that brings about if it that brings about strategic uh, stakeholders together for uh, creating a better understanding and yeah so i'm going i'm going to uh, quickly go through some of the stuff that we created specifically for children this is a mechanical exhibit where you press the button and you vote for environment so when the child gets a higher score is really happy and if he gets a lower score and he's like oh maybe i will carry a cloth bag next to the market you know and we also if you look in the background uh, you have all of us as children have played this game of putting in all the coins into the uh, in the central round so we created some rounded fish it has to be round so we create we designed it in a way that we created a rounded fish and the fish could roll right into the center and this was one of the with adults i mean when you create a children play area you also create it with the knowledge that adults would also be one of those coming and playing the game so it has to be equally strong the buttons have to be well done and all of that 
Uh, this was uh, specifically I'd like to say something about this. This is the singing wall. Uh, this is one of the NID, the National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad student design project. And when the student came on as an intern into the Chilika in, in the British program, he uh, we sat together and the wall that we created was, you know, the way that it works is there's a hole there. You put your hand in and you, have, and you hear human laughter. So you, the deeper you put your hand in, the louder the laughter. So we created this with bird calls. So if you put your hand into one of the bird, uh, say for example the parakeet, you put it, you put it low first, uh, softly. It, the parakeet, uh, of course, soft sounds. The more you, the deeper your hand goes in, the parakeet really gives out that voluminous screech. So this is called the uh, the singing wall, and children could really create a cacophony in the children playroom. This is just uh, set up and it was being tested. This is another mechanical exhibit in the children's play area. You uh, you again vote for and see how environment friendly you are. Some of the models, some of the things that you brought in into uh, into an exhibit center is you really no need, don't need to bring nature into the center. However, when you create a diorama, you bring in some of the elements that gives that gives a sense of what is available in that reserve. You may not always see a sarus. This is this is from uh, from another wetland area called Boat. You may not always see a SARS when you go on a bird watching trip. So you bring in all the elements and create this inter create this uh, interactive. You have a, a you know you have in the front where you can hear bird calls. You can see how the bird fishes. You can learn about what the bird uh, role is in the environment. So this is an interactive diorama. You have a, a computer in the front which gives you all the stuff that is available in the diorama. Uh, Chilka also is an area where birds come in hundreds. So what is the migratory route of these birds? So maybe you want to know. <laughs> Sorry. One more minute. So you, you probably want to know where the bird comes from. And, and this is a, a international map, bird migratory route map, where you press a species of bird and then and then you know where it comes from and where it lands, what it does, and its endangered status, it all of that. So we created an interactive bird migration route for children. Uh, this is a visitor area, which this is a touch and feel exhibit. So one of the stories that you see, one of the exhibit that you see in the front is the Iravadi dolphin. While we were setting up the interpretation center there, the one of the Iravadi dolphin died. So immediately uh, the fishermen brought it ashore. We were there on the site. We created a model and we said people don't have an opportunity to really, uh, you know, connect with the Iravari dolphin. However, they know that it's a highly endangered species and they come in hopes to watch the dolphin. So we created a touch and feel exhibit. This is an exhibit with people hug, people touch, and I feel uh, Dr. Salim Ali said, conservation begins in the heart and it travels to the mind. So an interpretation center has to have all of these to create uh, friends for, for biodiversity, friends for conservation, friends for children. Some of the photo panels in the center and of course, several other things. So we also created a, an outdoor signage. Uh, out of the shell that is uh, that is from from Chilka. So this is also one of the ways of communicating to people. That is a it's a it's a lagoon. It's a wetland ecosystem, and and this is a wonderful way of uh, of identifying that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lima, for an interesting and complete view of interpretation using different media for various stakeholders. I'm sure everybody enjoyed this virtual journey around Chilika and got insights into the hows and what's of the entire process of interpretation for spreading the conservation message about this important petland habitat. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. I will now invite Mr. Samir Shukla uh, for the next presentation. Uh, Mr. Samir Shukla is a professionally trained architect. He is subsequently also trained as a lawyer. He's a founder partner of Pagma Cumulus Consortium, engaged in designing and setting up 
of wildlife interpretation centers and exhibits in locations such as the Kobe Tiger Reserve, Kaziranga National Park, Kanha, Pange, Sri, and also the uh, Mysore Zoo. Uh, he has worked in Perambiculum Wildlife Sanctuary, Gir National Park, and Nalsarovar. His main area of interest is behavior of complex natural systems, especially biology, and he has taught systems related courses at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and the National Institute of Design. He's a regular writer for the Times of India online platform where he links science and real life policy based issues under the title of Science Nomad. Over to you, sir. Sir, you are mute. Yeah, sir, sure. can you unmute? Yes. Sir, we can't again, hear you, you're... Mr. Shukla. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. So Lima has covered, I guess, what an interpretation center has to be in entirety. And I think I'll just focus on the experiences that I had over the years while, you know, trying to do something in this field, which is not really that commonly done in India. So interpretation centers, I trained as an architect from School of Architecture, Ahmedabad, and, uh, you know, we have the luxury of having C in Ahmedabad. And C in those days was maybe, I'm talking about 20 years back. So it was the only agency actually doing interpretation centers uh, across the country. And I came to know about it because they had a project in Kana and uh, they wanted to do an animatronic display of a tiger hunt. Now in those days, 20 years back, I see circuits were also something that people had not heard about. So animatronic, animatronics was something that was absolutely a new idea. But anyway, I picked up uh, that project uh, and then we tried discovering how this entire domain works. And there are a couple of things that, uh, you know, there are certain challenges that I feel that I can share at this point of time after this experience of 20 years is that uh, the, the first issue that uh, interpretation center sector has is that there is a integration of architecture and there are other typically exhibition design experts and communicators and scientists. So it's a very complex uh, project. It has got a lot of stakeholders of different nature and different type coming together. And unfortunately, the primary client would be the government agency like forest department. So they would have their own limitations of how they would structure a project. So there is going to be a very big complex issue of, you know, how to get the right people on the board. So I can understand that the challenge that is thrown in here is in zoo. And that is why it's a controlled environment. It's not exactly out there in the wild, like the center that we have done. Like we did a center, we, when we worked in Kana, my team stayed in Kana for 90 days and uh, they got chased by tiger also. So these kind of things are, you know, not part of the normal, uh, you know, project executing teams that you have. So the primary project issue that you must address is that you must get an architect on the board from the very beginning. Because ultimately, interpretation center is a mix of a museum. It has tremendous amount of technicalities involved and uh, that technicalities cannot be, you know, kind of sorted at a later date. So best is that that if you are forming a team for bidding for this uh, exhibition, this uh, zoo design, zoo interpretation project, I think you should get an architect on the board very from the very beginning. Now there are other stakeholders that you will have to find out. And one of the extremely critical part of doing interpretation center is that you should be scientifically very accurate. And this scientific accuracy is not very easy to get. So Lima showed those uh, SARS crane models. Now, you know, we have over 20 years, we must have made at least 150 species of birds through fiber modeling. And any, even one bird that you want to make, if you want to make it biologically accurate, you want it morphologically accurate, it is a research exercise. It is not something that will happen. Typically, if you are going to do good quality work, then you'll have to put in a lot of research in actually understanding the biological and the ecological dynamics of the situation. So for a designer, it is maybe not something that is happening every day because when you're designing, the briefs are comparatively clearer. But if you're designing an interpretation center, then the brief is not that clear because you'll have to create your own brief by understanding the opportunities that the complexity of nature would give to you. 
So even if you are doing something as simple as maybe putting a signboard in front of the, you know, in front of the tiger's enclosure, it may look very simple, but to get it correct, I think you'll have to at least spend three hours of researching. Otherwise you'll get something or the other wrong. And that is what keeps happening to most of the work that we see around here, because uh, till you don't find dedicated people who are really interested in wildlife and having that you know, desire for accuracy, you are not going to be able to deliver the kind of stuff that is required. So first is that get your team right, get your team right with an architect on board, get your team right with the wildlife researchers on board. If you're not personally inclined to research on it, then comes the communication part. And that is when you will have to ideate with your team, because uh, uh, when there is a simple information that uh, tiger has this kind of stripes, that information can obviously interpreted in various ways about the way that stripe works in night, the way that stripe works when the, the deer looks at it, because deer obviously has a different color spectrum view. So these are the kind of areas which are, which have to be that they'll come out by discussing with people. And that is when designer would be able to find an opportunity. So the interpretation center, the spatial distribution, the way the public will use it is one part that maybe is easy to take care of, but finding interpretation opportunities, which are actually going to be the anchor of, you know, connecting people with the interpretation center is maybe the biggest challenge. So you have your wildlife people on board and you have a discussion with them, then maybe slowly you will be able to come out with what Lima has shown as a media matrix that you have certain information that you want to communicate using certain mediums. Now comes one more very tricky question, which I have not been able to answer for myself over these years is that who are we interpreting for? Now, typically all of us, I know we are all English speaking, educated, smart people talking about wildlife, but are we really the stakeholder of Indian wildlife? Are we the people who really need to understand the nitty gritties of the ecosystems around us? No, we are not really that much of a stakeholder. We are kind of distant stakeholders talking about it from, you know, from a different perspective. But these interpretation centers are being used by the masses. Now the masses may not have the kind of, you know, interest in the complexities that you can present. But one great advantage of wildlife is that the human brain is naturally connected to appreciate, uh, you know, wildlife. It, every child gets excited when she sees an animal. So these are the very simplistic, uh, you know, dimensions of this sector that you, if you can capture them, maybe then you may not have a very impressive interpretation center, like, you know, uh, something like you walk into in America, but maybe it will be very effective. So I'll give a very simple example. You know, when I went to, uh, I went to Geneva and, uh, you know, there's a son there. Son is doing the great experiment there and they have an interpretation center out there. So that is the, that is the state of the art in the richest country. And, you know, you feel that, okay, they must have done some really high tech interpretation center. And yes, they have done two interpretation center. One is a very high tech interpretation center with a lot of artistic, all laser light and, you know, uh, some simulated stuff on the top of the ceiling. And, you know, you, you are sitting in some kind of weird chair and looking at that and very fancy. And just next to it is there's a very nice old fashioned interpretation center where you have these panels and you touch things and they have wooden you know boxes and you open things and you you know you try putting things together and you know physics explained in that rudimentary way where you know and if you're from Ahmedabad you see in maybe community science center but when I went through both the displays I realized that in, in terms of the information that I got out of both of them the second one was the the, the high-tech interpretation center was absolutely of no use it was just a fancy you know, it, it's an it's an art, you know, maybe an, a designer's dream to do an interpretation center like that. But in terms of communicating information, I doubt it really contributed at all. So I always very strongly feel that when you're designing an interpretation center, the simpler, the better. Now, you know, we have a justification, a cruel justification of this that we always like to share that for Indian masses, mentalism is, the, is like you, you make any bird model, they'll come and put scratches on it. Or you do anything, they'll come and write names on it. But they are us, they are our people and they do it. So instead of calling it vandal proof, I always feel that you design your interpretation centers, which are very robust and very simple. And you would start appreciating that at the end of the day, maybe they work a lot better. So, you know, I would love to do some more question answers when, you know, when this thing comes and some real stakeholders have some technical issues to discuss. But I'll bring the last point, which I think is maybe 
a challenge for your generation, maybe not exactly a challenge that we took with that much awareness. This is the AR VR introduction. Now, you know, frankly speaking, the interpretation center that Lima showed, or the interpretation centers we do even today, most of them are fiber models and you know dioramas and photographs, and maybe now video screens. But obviously, the world has moved a lot. Today, you can do interpretation centers. We also done some holograms because obviously that is all now coming into the fancy of the clients also. But, you know, the biggest challenge that now we have to talk about is that, that when you're using this technology in an interpretation center, I have a very, very weird psychological resistance to this, you know, because this whole connect with nature, wildlife is very sensorial. It's very physical. You touch things, you get your hands dirty, you smell them. That's when you really get a sync with the with the environment, sync with the ecology around you. That's when you really feel things, you know. So if interpretation center becomes a replacement of visiting a wildlife park or visiting or sensing wildlife or nature and its complexity, I would say that that is a disaster in making. So if we really make interpretation centers which are like Singapore, uh, you know, with something very fancy, I don't think that they would. It would be very impressive. Maybe you as a designer would feel that, okay, you've done something very smart and you can put it up on your website and it will look fancy. But I think that, see, interpretation centers, even if you're a designer, you don't do it for money. You don't do it for those kind of normal, you know, project uh, kind of aspirations that you have because this is, a, this is almost a pious job. You know, it's something that you do because it's damn necessary for this planet, for the nation, for the people who are using this planet. So, you do it with that kind of sense and then you you stop having those kind of intellectual aspirations about it but you have aspirations of communication you have aspirations of connecting the, the way you know the the, the last end, the statement that lima made that is what salim ali also made that it has to pass through the heart and then only it goes to the mind and that's the emotional connect that you can bring in so interpretation center if i sum it up i'm exceeding 10 minutes is that it, it's it's a process where you have to be scientifically very accurate you have to get your team right but you have to understand that you are designing it for India. You have to understand that you are designing it for human beings. You understand that it's not a movie. It's not. It's not a you know Sanjay Leela Bansali episode that you want to make. You want to make something that connects with the arts of people, and that is the brief that you start with. I think you would will deliver something. Thank you very much. So that's that's Thank my you. yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for your insights regarding all aspects, including challenges that are involved in planning a project of complex nature. I think the takeaway would be that simplicity is a virtue. So thank you very much for this. Uh, here now, I will request our third presenter for the evening. Uh, she's Ms. Komalika Bose. Uh, Ms. Bose is a heritage planner, museum consultant and educator with 15 years of experience in the built and cultural heritage sector. She has worked on people-centric heritage conservation initiatives across India and consulted on significant museum design and exhibition projects. She was an assistant professor with SEPT University, Ahmedabad from 2008 to 15, and has participated in international conferences and workshops. She has co-curated the exhibition Bengal's Durga at London's Totally Thames Festival in 2018, and has authored five books, including Rohusala Legacy, and the people called uh, Kolkata. She has a master's in historic preservation planning from Cornell University as a Fulbright scholar and is a recipient of several prestigious international fellowships. Komolika is an expert member of the e-commerce International Scientific Committee on Shared Built Heritage. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Gauri, and I would also like to thank Dr. Sonali Ghosh uh, and the Central Zoo Authority for inviting me to uh, this webinar uh, today. It's been I've I've, I've been looking at uh, some of the previous webinars as well, and it's really interesting thread of conversations. And I hope I can add some value uh, to the same. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen now. Is this uh, is this visible now in full screen? Yes. 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 Okay. So Thank I am you. going to. Um, 
I'm going to talk about conservation and interpretation in a slightly more broad based uh, way today. And due to the limited time as well, I'm going to touch about, upon some points and it's not, it might not be an exhaustive presentation, but I hope uh, it will be a th like a thought starter and like uh, provocations to the young design students who would be participating in this con um, competition. So the idea is that we 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 know we kind of still look at and the masses of India still kind of look at zoos as uh, menageries and how, but how do we through design through interpretation through very carefully calibrated uh, strategies shift the idea from uh, the idea of uh, the menagerie to the idea of an educational or a conservation center. And I think zoo authorities today are more cognizant about that and through their policy making and through um, through programs such as such as organizing a, a very a capacity development a webinar series like this are also more aware of these shifts which are also taking place globally. But when we need to bring it down to the masses, how do we also break that notion through a good interpretation and good design that zoos have moved away from being a sort of a, a, a menagerie and a collection of exotic animals to using these powerful tools and uh, positioning them as conservation and interpretation centers. So uh, I would again start with a very fundamental uh, question uh, with, of what is therefore the rule, ro role of the zoo, that it is not um, a, a museum of exotic animals, but now there are structures that focus on conservation of endangered species. And for this, of course, I'm not the best person to talk about this. There are several experts on the panel as well today who can talk about that aspect, but I'm going to focus a little more on the aspect of environmental education where uh, through planning and environment related activities through exhibitions through interpretation centers through educational routes um, some very scientific technical um, issues and even like uh, urgently uh, urgent issues for the planet can be uh, simplified and brought down and re made relatable for a much a broader public uh, talking, speaking diverse tongues and languages and coming from div a diverse socioeconomic, socio uh, cultural backgrounds. So uh, therefore my, my uh, understanding and thought a starter for today today's presentation would be to look at the idea of an interpretation center as a repository of nature culture and architecture in a sort of holistic way in a sort of holistic vision where nature encompasses of course the, and and this is within within the precinct of the zoo um, itself uh, which looks at the rich vegetation, the water bodies, the diverse flora and fauna, and the bi biodiversity which might be pre uh, present simultaneously in this within the zoo precinct itself. So looking at it in totality and not just looking at uh, the animals and the sort of uh, uh, enclosures and settings that have been created for there. Interpreting culture in uh, the the a more broader uh, sense beyond the precinct of uh, the physical zoo to talk about and capture wider issues of uh, human and natural uh, the, the the harmony uh, or the imbalance uh, between the human and the natural world the the balance that is required and the mutual respect that is required uh, for society and all of us and uh, and wildlife and that we are seeing today with the kind of issues uh, challenges and even novel diseases that are being created uh, because uh, these kind of imbalance uh, is taking place between the human world and the natural world and with that these sort of issues and understanding how do we better uh, be prepared for care and conservation of our wildlife of our marine life and then coming down to the third uh, pillar of architecture, which is again looking at within the zoo precinct itself, the presence of several historic structures on the site, several historic markers and stories and associations on the site, which might come from the uh, the either the natural setting and landscape of 
where the zoo is located or its provenance and patronage that it might have received at a certain point of time that lead led to its birth and uh, and the way forward into the future through good design through adaptive reuse through really looking at these places not the way they were imagined when they were first born but really using appreciation interpretation and design as tools to reimagine um, the such places in the 21st century for an Indian um, audience. So um, I would uh, request, therefore, and urge um, everyone who participates in this com competition to look at the interpretation center, not just as a building where a design solution needs to be uh, presented and submitted, but in this sort of broad framework of nature culture architecture to make it more holistic and enriching for, um, for the audience. Uh, I will just touch upon a few of these touch point um, aspects of what I mean by nature, culture and architecture. Uh, so looking at the first pillar of interpreting nature visit, uh, within zoos, the intention really becomes to decentralize visitor engagement and to integrate the experience um, of the zoo nature scapes and not just that of the, uh, the building for greater experiential learning. Uh, we, we kind of say that what is the sort of um, guarantee that everybody who comes to the zoo will go to the interpretation center. So, but why do we need to imagine the zoo, uh, the, the interpretation center as a big box uh, experience? Uh, can it be decentralized through efforts such as a small um, adventure activities um, in, in, in the landscaped areas of the zoo? through uh, bicycle nature trails, because there would be a biodiversity and um, a, a range of uh, flora and fauna, uh, heritage trails to discover the kind of different heritage structures which lie embedded and scattered within the, 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 the zoo precinct and sort of curated also uh, tree walks, et cetera. And I think uh, in the first, our first speaker covered many other ways in which outdoor programming can take place. But the idea is to create an interest, create, um, peak the interest of the visitor to then uh, go into the interpretation center and a sort of marriage between the outdoor and the indoor as a seamless experience. And I would, um, this is an exhibition that I co-curated in London um, as Dr. Gauri also mentioned the Bengal's Durga the and we deliberately kept this um, exhibition on the outdoor it, on the banks of the South Bank this was on South Bank on the Thames and we deliberately did not want to take in a museum or a gallery space to um, to display this but the idea was how could we make it an urban encounter that brought surprise and joys to the passers-by who might not have had any intention of uh, going for an exhibition in London on Bengal's Durga Puja. But just by the fact that it was there on the outdoor, they kind of encountered it, whether they were sitting on a bench, whether they were just taking a stroll on the promenade. So the out idea is to achieve the secondary educational mandates of the zoo or of the interpretation center through curated inserts at strategic locations, which become an extension of the program of the interpretation center rather than express uh, um, rather than uh, uh, mandating that everybody has to be uh, go into the building only so how do you also use these uh, moments and encounters to draw people in and to draw their um, uh, interest and we we've seen uh, many of course many zoos do this i've personally experienced this in the bronx uh, zoo in new york as well where through curating river walks through creating bike trails and uh, you know the uh, pockets pockets of activities such as adventure treetops etc it 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 not only gives you additional things to do and uh, experience the fauna and flora and the uh, the, the rich landscape natural landscape of the zoo but it also uh, makes you want to then go and see the zoo center and the other sort of build buildings which have other activities uh, uh, interpretative activities embedded within themselves now um again uh, elaborating a bit on my second point now of interpreting culture within zoos the with the objective that visitor management allow uh, visitor engagement allows us to extend 
to the broader natural worlds, natural wo the worlds which are not uh, within the zoo precinct itself, which talks about the natural world, the habitats, and environmental learning and critical environmental issues that are uh, very relevant for us to imbibe and transmit to young learners as well as adults. So for visitors, the relevance and resilience of a zoo stems from the re relationship and the awareness that while they are in an urban setting, in a city or in a town, in an urbanized zoo or an urbanized aquarium, the how do you build a larger and a broader connection with the distant natural habitats for, of each of these species that they're looking at? So with that, uh, the idea is uh, to use the interpretation center as a pivot and to, to generate these conversations where uh, through programmatic uh, detailing, through innovative curation and curatorial uh, tools and a very smart uh, and simple integration of uh, technology, there, there are three broad issues that we could really open up people's minds to, which is, of course, the awareness of the natural habitat, which becomes one of the uh, first and foremost uh, things or aspects. Um, and, but then also building a respect for the ecosystem, and this becomes even more so important in the times that we are in today, that man is not the ruler of the animal kingdom and how only the, the planet can survive. And how do we look at each, each animal, each bird, each uh, species, not as standalone for their beauty and the fun that we see in seeing them, but the intrinsic interlink and interrelationship between each of these, which forms the ecosystem of our planet. And, fi and finally, this balance between the built and the natural worlds. And as man gets uh, grows more and develops more and gets more greedy uh, for land, how does he kind of um, encroach into what were the natural worlds and the natural habitats of the same species that they come to appreciate and uh, look at in the zoos? So uh, again, so this is a more holistic view of how do we utilize the interpretation center to build uh, these kind of conversations, to trigger these kind of dialogues, and how do we build, therefore, displays to, um, to address uh, these. And finally, the third pillar of interpreting architecture within the zoo. The idea is really that within India, several zoos are located within pre-existing historic settings or have a very strong context, um, whether it's natural or it's built. And how do you sort of decode the messages and the meanings in these heritage city settings and contexts for uh, to to benefit and add an additional layer uh, and and that is what would make each zoo unique because each zoo is in a different uh, city in a different town it has different cultural meanings and uh, cultural landscapes and histories and how do we also use the zoo uh, to build and reinforce some of this identity heritage and some of this identity so uh, this is uh, what we find in zoos, some of these zoos across India. These images are specifically from the zoos in Mumbai and Lucknow. So we find uh, some abandoned, beautiful abandoned structures. We find clock towers. We find historical markers uh, such as the Baradari um, in Lucknow. So how do we really uh, find a relevance for these places and uh, activate them either programmatically or as events that could happen here as an something in the evening, something uh, for children. So how does the interpretation center, which is maybe a dedicated building, then utilize the other heritage settings and resources within the zoo campus to form a more integrated, holistic experience for its visitors? And here again, now I will come utilize uh, some of my engagements as a design, uh, design educator to look at, of course, through other projects, the, the attitude of adaptive reuse that uh, this competition is uh, seeking to achieve this interpretation is center is not a new build and not a new architecture project but an adaptive reuse project which is looking at contemporization so how do you use the zoo as a setting and a site and what are the kind of uh, detailed site studies and responses that uh, you do and what are the attitudes towards the old and the new does the new become contemporary uh, something about and 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 that and this is really the power of design that design can help shift 
uh, behavior. Uh, some of our previous speakers spoke about uh, vandalism, about you know uh, the, the, the general Indian attitude that we should create robust and simple things so that uh, you know they're not damaged. While all of that is valid, I think uh, good design also has a, a scope to shift uh, user behavior to bring in more awareness and care when you see something that has been made with care, love, and thought. And I think the opportunity in this interpretation center also also is to seed new attitudes towards the old and the new, towards the historic and the contemporary, and really look at uh, through, again, these are projects, student projects that I have uh, led as to really how do you convert very mundane, very uh, uh, office spaces or, you know, these kind of auditorium spaces and really retrofit them into a, 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 an engaging historic interior, which uh, which engages people, which uh, across age groups, across, across uh, uh, um, economic and demographic backgrounds to really want to come here and love this place as their own, not love, as, as something which is a, a unique contribution to their city. Because most of the people who come to zoos are city residents with their children. Sometimes, some of some percentage are, of course, visitors and tourists, but the repeat visitors are always the residents of your own city. So how do you uh, build a sense of pride and identity through giving them something? And the interpretation center becomes a very, very um, a good uh, a new intervention uh, to, to build pride and identity for the city as well. So my last and concluding slide would be that to me, the interpretation center offers a huge opportunity as a driver of the relationship between society and wildlife to build attitudes of empathy and conservation as a fully immersive experience through curatorial narratives and design strategies that link nature, culture, architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for the insights into a holistic cross-cutting vision that an interpretation center can showcase with connects between nature, culture, attitudes, and of course, architecture and planning. Thank you very much, Kamalika. Thank um, you. I will ask our next speaker now, uh, Ms. Dipti. Uh, she's a nature lover by interest. Dipti is a Bangalore-based landscape architect. She has completed her master's in architecture in landscape architecture from SEPT University, Ahmedabad, and a bachelor's in architecture from National Institute of Technology, Calicut. She received a gold medal there for the best overall performance. After having worked in various leading firms and briefs with the garden of Bevis Bhava in Sri Lanka, Dipti founded her landscape studio, Dharitri. The firm's nature-inspired design won the International Garden Festival Award 2020, conducted at UNESCO World Heritage Site at Chamon sur Loire, France, the first Indian entry to win in 28 years. With great interest in academics, she also teaches as a guest lecturer at various colleges. Over to you, Dipti. Thanks a lot, Dr. Gauri, for the introduction. And special thanks to Dr. Sonali Ghosh, Central Zoo Authority and uh, Niti Ayog Atal Innovation Mission Team and Gargi Roy from EY team for inviting me for this webinar series. So I was very interested when this whole uh, Zootopia competition was launched and it looked very interesting. And uh, with that, uh, this webinar series is a great initiative. So I would like to congratulate all of you for that. And uh, coming to my talk, I always, I feel most of you will agree to that, that uh, nature and the environment in which we live, uh, they can be great teacher. They can inspire us in many ways. So for all the students who are attending the talk and especially participating in the competition, I will broadly tell that my talk is divided into three parts. So the first part talks about my childhood memories and how they inspired me in my designing and to become a landscape architect one day. And the second uh, part is about the broad storyline of my projects, like the sense of place, connect with nature. So it will be interesting to have such aspects in your design as well. And the third uh, part is like how Dr. Gauri mentioned about the France competition. So I feel uh, it will be interesting if um, a narration or a story line is there in the uh, in your is there to develop your ideas also design so that could also be an interesting tool in the broad development so we'll start the presentation 
Uh, Avinash, yeah. The topic of my talk is landscape expressions, memory, symphony, and association with nature. My introduction to landscape has greatly been an extension of my memories and associations. They very much inspired me in my thought process and design thinking. And these even include my childhood memories and experiences. I'm sure most of us would have enjoyed running and trying to catch the milkweed flowers as a kid. These were the small joys of life. Over the years, I learned about its growth habit, the religious significance of the flowers, and it serving as a host plant for the monarch butterfly. I had the opportunity of staying in different states of India from a young age. The changing landscapes of each region were wonderful early lessons on how vegetation changed with different geographies and climate. A school in Orissa was based on J. Krishnamurti's method of teaching. So education often extended beyond the classroom boundaries. This sketch is of a memory of the school picnic where we students used to collect sal leaves and stitch them into plates and eat the locally prepared delicious food on them sitting under a people tree. And later we shifted a native in Alapi district. The landscape was in stark contrast. The plants were always evergreen, the weather was hot and humid and there was a unique architectural and cultural environment which again had evolved due to the natural and historical context. A family temple was a good example of contextual design. Situated along the banks of the local river, the architecture was simple, human scaled and functional. The adjoining sacred grove, apart from protecting an extremely sensitive biodiversity, also supplied the basic necessities for the temple hence providing a self-sufficient, ecologically balanced setting. And then we had the Harvest Festival of Honor. Here in the photograph is a pukala or a flower rangoli we used to make using the garden flowers. Our home had a homestead garden. It's a traditional practice of using the adjoining garden area for cultivation of trees, vegetables and flowers for worship along with livestock, poultry, and fish for the basic family needs. This made our house self-sufficient and nurtured a unique biodiversity in itself. The sketch on the right is a scene from my study room. It was very interesting to see the mongoose chasing the snakes and the snakes going after the frogs and the birds feeding on the guava and mango fruits. A food chain existed in the garden and there was so much biodiversity in just one square foot of land. Since agriculture was a predominant occupation of the region, many indigenous cultivation techniques were developed from the topography of the land, the soil conditions, and monsoon seasons. The photograph on the left shows how ducks are used in the region for organic farming. They eat the worms and the pests, and in return add manure to the paddy fields. These day-to-day experiences inculcated in me an association to nature and made me feel its smell, textures, intricacies, and its dynamic qualities. The environment in which we live can be a great teacher. And thus, they formed a broad storyline for my projects. The first topic is oneness with nature. Nature is organic, alive, growing, and yet in constant balance. It creates an interesting theater with its diverse artists and the ever-changing seasons. While designing a landscape area for any client, I thereby create spaces which would make one observant to the fragrance, seasons, the music of nature, and the sun, rain, wind, and thus revive the senses. This fig tree has grown so well in a residence garden that apart from giving lots of fruits and supporting birds and insects, is also a favorite spot of the children to climb on it, thus developing a connect with nature at a young age. A simple walkway or a trail is all that one needs to experience an orchard. The simple details like reflection and patterns on water can create such a great impact on a design. The second point is sense of place. The designs aim to celebrate the spirit of the place the culture, beliefs, be appropriate to the setting and context and thereby make the users feel at home. 
This informal environment thus creates joy, provides comfort, and develops a serene environment to relax, introspect, and contemplate. An empty residence site, as seen on the left, has been transformed to a cozy outdoor space using local materials and plants. The humanized scale places create a feeling of home and comfort. Another important aspect is including the functional aspirations. The question often arises while designing. What are the Indian needs of an open space? A veranda or a courtyard is more than just a transition between the indoors and outdoors. Similarly, a garden has multiple usage and needs for different project typologies. In this garden, spaces were created to relax, contemplate, play, have an outdoor space to set a table and dine, to entertain their guests, to, veg to do vegetable gardening. The shaded pavilion was made with customized stained glasses, which blends with the colors of the turkey mosaic tiles used in the flooring, as well as creates an interesting light and shadow pattern during different times of the day. The next point is artful ornamentation. I have always felt art and design coexist. It adds stories, warmth, color, and develops an additional connect to the design. I really enjoy using boulders, customized jali, paving, or even in-situ made light fixtures to incorporate that personal touch to the design. And the last pointing is planting and creating a microhabitat. The planting design generally comprises a diversity of plants, making the space look natural and rustic yet taped, creating a civilized wilderness. The garden is allowed to grow in a subtly controlled but visibly wild form, adding a timeless quality to the landscape. They thereby welcome a wide variety of birds, bees, butterflies in the garden, mimic the randomness of the nature, and also shower a wide range of flowers, foliage, herbs, and fruits, thus creating a microhabitat in the site. The planting often is mixed with herbs and medicinal plants along with nectar-producing flower, flowering plants. The first image of Stachy Tarfeta indica is a favorite of the butterflies. And this exploration was continuing when last year our design entry won for the International Garden Festival, which happens in the castle of chaumont sur loire in France. It's an annual competition where 20 garden designs are selected from across the world and executed at site. It was a wonderful opportunity. I got to explore Paris and experience its famous architecture, the historical and the modern ones, and to witness parks, public art installations, streets, squares, and boulevards. I was very fascinated by the public open spaces. Shaman Salwar is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is located in a town called Blua, which is about one and a half hour train journey from Paris. The quaint town of Blua is located along the valley of Blua River and was a former royal city. The thousand year old Renaissance castle is situated in a 32 hectare property. So every year there's a theme for the garden design. This year's theme was Gardens of the Earth Return to Mother Earth. As per Greek belief, Goddess Gaia is considered as the giver of life and personifies fertile earth and is a de deity comparable to Goddess Parvati. The design had to glorify the wonders of Mother Earth. Design ideas were welcome, which represented the culture of the participating country. So from numerous entries, 20 garden designs were selected. This was the first time an Indian entry had won and executed the garden design in 28 years. The design drew inspiration from the agricultural practices in India and the traditional practice of the self-sufficient homestead gardens. Mother Earth has always been worshipped as the life giver or the goddess of ripened harvest. Our annual festivals like Bihu, Onam, Lodi, etc. celebrate the bountiful crops received that year and serve as a gratitude to the blessings of Goddess Prithvi or Mother Earth. So even for this design, my childhood memories and experiences played a major role. 
The coming four slides show the design concept. The visitor enters the 2,000 square feet garden area through dense planting along with fragrant plants, which can be used for worship and was inspired from the French perfume industry. The aroma imbibes a welcoming feel and the planting thicket arouses a sense of curiosity. On further transition, the garden starts revealing itself. The walkway gradually opens to a wider zone overlooking a series of stepped terraces, which abstract the paddy fields, with carefully selected planting palette mimicking the various stages of the paddy growth. A shallow circular pond at the base reflects the sky and the surrounding landscape. As per Indian beliefs, Prithvi Mata or Mother Earth is complementary to Dua's Pitta or Father Sky. A curved bench placed along the wider walkway allows the visitors to relax and contemplate. The planting transcends from fragrance garden to fruit, medicinal and herbs garden, deriving inspiration from the homestead gardens. The walkway further leads to the step terraces where the visitors can walk along the abstract paddy fields. The pathway finally leads to the exit point, thereby completing the circumambulatory path or Pradakshina path paying tribute to the sacredness of Mother Earth. The garden got inaugurated in May last year. This is the entry to the design. A signage at the entrance gives a description of the design. The entry area with dense foliage and fragrant plants creates a welcoming feel and a sense of curiosity. The walkway opens to the reflective pond which beautifully reflects the sky and the stepped paddy fields. It felt great to see the pictures of the completed garden. This image is from the corner bench overlooking the reflective pond. The bench with the wide variety of medicinal plants and herbs, which is commonly used in the French cuisine. The walkway leading up to the stepped paddy terraces. The garden got published in various international papers and magazines and thanks to this project, I finally got a name to my studio, Dharitri, which means earth or land. Ditti, are you, uh, is this complete now? Yes. So, yes, I basically want to tell Kat, uh, we can get inspired from anything like it could be nature, from your memories, from your uh, environment. It could be art, music, literature, anything. So, yes, I, uh, best wishes for the students also and looking forward to the design. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and for allowing us to share your personal journey uh, with the science of interpretation and for beautifully showcasing how the simplest day-to-day -day experience can inspire design projects. And now for the artist's perspective from Ms. Sangeeta Kadu. Her exploration into the realm of wildlife and nature painting stems from a deep appreciation for both the natural world and the arts. She aspires to create work, uh, I'm sorry, she aspires to create work that emphasizes the importance of our rich biodiversity and evokes pride and respect in our natural heritage. She has been working in partnership with wildlife organizations on various art science projects and to help build awareness through education and outreach. Twice nominated as the finalist for the BBC's Wildlife Artist of the Year Award, she has several commissioned projects to her credit and has published across a wide range of journals, books, and magazines. One of her most ambitious, ambitious published projects to date has been an internationally collaborated fine arts coffee table book on hummingbirds of the world in association with the Gorgas Foundation, Texas, and Felestrations, Bangalore. In 2017, she was entrusted with a project to set up, curate, and design a unique grassroots centric nature information center, Kolemati, adjacent to the Malay Madeshwara Wildlife Sanctuary, Karnataka, in collaboration with Nature Conservation Foundation. Over a decade back, Sangeeta co-founded Green 
Grats, which continues to facilitate a series of nature art workshops with a hope to inspire a new generation of nature artists. Over to you, Sangeeta. Thank you very much, Kauri. I'll go ahead and share my screen first. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Yeah. You can do it full screen. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much um, to Sonali Kosh and the team at CZA for putting together this wonderful competition. And I'm quite excited to see the results of this at the end. And um, uh, and in mostly this whole topic is uh, really close to my heart. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing this. One second. Oops, one minute, my screen. Now, can you still see the presentation? No, no there that. is just a blank, blank oh, screen. Sorry, I'm sorry, one minute. Yeah. Yeah, we can see now. You need. Um, yeah, got it. Or got it. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so uh, I have been listening to many talks that are going on um, from the past few weeks on this uh, particular uh, YouTube channel, and I think. It is like a treasure house of, uh, uh, you know, talks about zoo design uh, right now. And it's amazing for anybody who wants to get into it. Um, I have um, uh, I've listened to architects, educators and uh, designers and researchers um, on this, uh, talking about this topic about nature interpretation center and zoo designs over the past few weeks. And uh, here I will, uh, I hope to give a different perspective through the eyes of an artist to the people who are uh, part of this competition. Um, I think it's been uh, uh, for me more than 15 years back that um, I got into this field of wildlife art and design. And, and um, uh, it's incredible. The natural world is so diverse and um, so it has um, everything from seeds, plants to animals and species that are on this planet. It's like absolutely incredible and inspiring. Um, it was uh, since a child that I have been instilled with this love and respect for the natural world. And um, I have learned uh, most importantly that we need to live together. Uh, we need to coexist with them and we need to, this planet is as much a home for them as it is for us humans. So with that notion in mind and with that whole concept, um, the respect for the wildlife and nature has influenced my work and my art life uh, in, um, in a big way, uh, quite tremendously actually. Um, I also realized that uh, there is more to um, artworks uh, that are artworks on a canvas of on canvas that is just hangs on a gallery. Um, I think there's a lot more to it. Um, to depict wildlife or nature art on canvas and to be able to showcase its beauty and diversity, um, it's not just as simple as that. Some, if these canvases can go ahead with a much stronger message, if they can uh, give a stronger message of uh, show, uh, if they can showcase the essence of the species, if they can help the viewer connect or get inspired and influenced by the species, um, and if the artworks can somehow create or stir some emotion with the uh, people that are viewing it, and that's when I think if they can start feeling for the species that they're looking looking at, that's when I think the canvas is a lot more meaningful, according to me. Um, 
art is very powerful and creativity and art go hand in hand. It, through art, you can not only show the subtleness of a species or you can show the drama or, and art also helps synthesize and uh, helps us com convey and communicate uh, the science and facts a lot more creatively uh, and a lot more aesthetically. Um, I have uh, seen that uh, with this particular uh, painting that I did, it was a commission project. Uh, I talk about this particular painting because it has something to do with the zoo experience that I had long back. Um, um, this was a commissioned work and uh, it's uh, many of you may know the species, some of you may not. Uh, this is quite common in many of the zoos that we um, go to. Um, this is the Bengal monitor lizard. Uh, so looking at the species in the wild or trying to observe it is super difficult. So I thought, you know, the best thing would be to go to the zoo, zoo and um, stand by it and make some sketches of it. So meanwhile, um, while I was making the sketches, uh, what I noticed was um, there were many people passing by, many kids, many parents uh, passing by, and they they used to look at the species, but no one knew what it was. Um, somebody said, Baba, ye counts a snake hai. Uh, and the parent really had no answer. Uh, he didn't even correct the child that it was not a snake. You know, and some people thought it was a crocodile. Um, they're like a crocodile dek and they used to run, pass by. There was one person probably in the many who passed by who called it a wuda. A wuda is a monitor lizard in Canada. So they called it a wuda, but then they were not sure. They're like, oh, oh, in Canada, they were like, oh, the wuda. But then they're like, ah, go te laba. You know, they, they, they said they don't know. Come, let's go. They just walked away. There was no information. The, the board was hardly visible. And then I think it, it just made me feel really sad to um, see people passing by and uh, not knowing what the species was in front of them. And um, that's when I realized information boards are so important and um, quite essential if you really need to, uh, if especially they're coming to a zoo to get to know about an animal or species and it becomes super important for them to know what they are looking at and um, try to understand what they're looking at and even learn that this species is found amongst us in India very much. You know, they know a lot about the zebras and giraffes but then they don't know much about our local wildlife itself. So information boards definitely make a big difference. Um, this particular uh, work, um, uh, I think um, it, it was through art as I was uh, working on more um, uh, nature uh, themed artworks uh, that I realized that I enjoyed collaborating with people uh, and uh, especially working with scientists and researchers because uh, there's a lot more an artist can gain with interactions with them. And, um, and thankfully uh, being interested in uh, nature since childhood, like I knew many of the concepts as well, but it's an added bonus if you work with a researcher or scientist in the field. So this was with A3, an organization in uh, Bangalore, uh, in collaboration with Vipro. We created a brochure on butterflies. So they had a huge campus and um, uh, they created a butterfly park uh, as a way to use the space that is there in the most uh, efficient way, I would say, and have a little brochure for people who pass by to understand or get to know the species that are coming and visiting the butterfly garden. So we had a brochure with the names of the butterflies and the plants that are shown in this um, uh, illustration are specific to the butterflies itself. Like uh, there are two kinds of plants that the butterflies are dependent on, which is uh, the host plants and then the nectar plants. Nectar plants, as it says, uh, plants that they get nectar out of. Host plants are specific and particular plants that these butterflies choose to lay their eggs on. They don't go and lay eggs on any random plant. So they are very picky. 
very particular about the plants that they lay their eggs on. So knowing the history or knowing a little more about butterflies would make your work a lot more um, uh, meaningful and a lot more efficient. A um, uh, lot and also send out the best message possible to everybody. Um, um here um i wanted to talk about um we all know that um art in many ways can definitely have a uh, an upper hand over photographs uh, and this particular example is what um uh, you know i could find for the best example that i could find uh well when you're trying to imagine that you're trying to put together um uh um, a list or an illustration or a poster on uh, the common species that are found, bird species that are found in a particular landscape. And do you think that all the species will just fly by and come pose for you and in the right angles and the right postures possible without any clutter for you to just say cheese and take a picture? No, that does not happen in the, in the field. Uh, so that's when you can resort to art wherein it makes you can compose um, uh, a composition you can put together a composition that is more suitable and uh, that can send out a message um, in uh, send out the right message to the people and stick to the science and the facts that you want to put out to people uh, so uh, this um, art especially um, has the power to highlight things and focus on things that are really required. And it also helps to um, dismiss things that are not required completely. Uh, it has, art gives a big control, especially architecture students, like you all know that how much control you have in designing something, if it's a building, uh, how much power and control you have, every little element that goes into the structure or putting together um, your buildings, every element can be controlled. Similarly, in art, we can control each and every element that is portrayed or showcased to the viewer. Uh, you can control the detailing, you can control the, the light, the color, the mood, and the, the textures, and a whole lot of things. The entire power is with your hand. And most of all, you can control the message that you send out. And that is most important, especially when you are trying to do a collaborative work with science and art. Uh, here is an example of a nature information center that um, I got to design in uh, Holemati uh, near um, uh, MM Hills, Malay um, Mahadeshwara um, Betta uh, Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, this is a uh, this is a place that uh, many tourists, uh, especially people uh, pilgrims. Uh, there's a famous temple. Uh, over here, and then many pilgrims visit this place, and the and the bigger uh, the audience that they um, attract is mainly a big Canada speaking audience. So the um, so the one of the pre requirements of this particular uh, nature center design was to make this whole space in Canada. At the same time, we had a little booklet in English that people could walk around with. Um, um, who could look at the designs and understand what is going on, what we have mentioned the same thing in Canada. Um, so this was mainly, uh, it's, it was a very small space that we had. Um, it was in a farmland and then we had um, uh, two little rooms that we had to design. We mainly used large format prints that, you know, covers the entire wall space. And, um, uh, and um, it was very important to uh, show the landscape that MM Hills was, or um, MM Hills Wildlife Sanctuary. We mainly depicted the flora and fauna that is in the surrounding landscape, because that is what matters to the people who live in the surrounding landscape or who visit the particular um, wildlife sanctuary as well. Uh, so, uh, the the other most important things while designing for a nature center which many of them have already mentioned in the earlier talks already is the content to collaborate with a researcher who can write the uh, content 
make it crisp and beautiful and to the point so also there is you know there are so many species in the landscape right you cannot end up showing all the species that are there you'll need so many such buildings to do that so you need to be able to pick and choose the species that needs to be depicted and um, so curating information is um, a, a really important task and something that you need to brainstorm and uh, think and do a lot of research uh, before putting the information out there. So this is the uh, tiger wall that we designed. Uh, this is just a, um, the design plan that we had on Photoshop uh, before we got it printed and that went on to the main wall space. Uh, so there are many aspects that we need to think of when we are designing uh, like the color scheme and then um, how simplified can we put across the message and at the same time what are the aspects that we want to touch upon because tiger is such an iconic species and an umbrella species we decided to dedicate the entire wall to it and we have a story to tell about it uh, so this is how the entire wall looked like once um, it was um, you know, uh, mounted up on the wall. And uh, I think for people trying to see this large uh, information piece in front of them, uh, it really creates an impact and, um, and they feel like reading or learning about uh, what they see in front of them. Um, as uh, the next room that we had, we spoke about uh, the flora and the birds and um, uh, the conservation aspects of it. And um, we also tried to, uh, uh, it, this was mainly an information space in uh, uh, some sense. Uh, interpretation is when you are directly interacting with uh, some of the panels and you're trying to understand. So we tried to add in a little element of interpretation wherein um, people could lift the panels and uh, read the answers below. Some had questions on top and they could read the answers below. And the circular ones on the left, they could slide the panels, um, panels and read the information about the particular plan. So whatever was reachable within reach, we tried to make it a little interactive. And this has been um, uh, loved by many people and uh, everyone wants to a read it makes them curious and want to see what is behind the panels or what the question is and what the answer could be um this particular mural was a big hit people stand in front of it and stare at it and are uh, really taken to uh, what's in front of them uh, they identify with many of the species and um, the best part is this information center has a person in charge who also interacts with the people as they are looking at something. Uh, so there was a lot of information sharing that happens and, and um, it's nice to see the interaction and the experiences that they share, share with us when they come to this nature space. We also had a few games for the children uh, that they can put together puzzles and to make it a little more interactive. Uh, here's a little story that I'd love to share. Um, uh, these two people had come to uh, mount all the panels. They're from Bangalore and uh, to come all the way to MML then took about two days to uh, put up all the works um, that we had created. And the best part is as they were putting up the works, they were also observing and looking and they were really awestruck actually. Uh, because I think in Bangalore, they've just been putting advertisement boards and panels and then um, it's not as exciting probably. And um, here trying to just look at artwork and as they were putting up everything, they were really, uh, 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 really they shared the joy with us. At the same time, um, you see on the, uh, the zoomed in panel, there's a seed and uh, some, uh, the seeds are flying off the seed pod. Uh, it was lunchtime and we were sitting out for lunch. And then uh, this person was sitting next to a creeper and it happened to have the seed pod with the uh, seeds flying off. And instantly he asked if this is what I've tried to depict inside on the panels. And that itself really gave me a sense of joy because he had noticed, he had seen it. And he immediately went inside and he took interest to read what is written there. And uh, that made a lot of difference because 
he noticed and he observed and that is what a nature information uh, according to me should do it should make people curious and make people notice and through art i think it has a really powerful way of really drawing someone's attention and trying to make them look and appreciate uh, what is around and the stories that we can we can share through art uh, so this is the Holimati Nature Information Center. This is what it was in the beginning when we started. Um, a small little building on a farmland. And this is what it became uh, at the end of like a year. And um, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of time that we put in. It was a lot of research and passion and a whole lot of work that went into this. And again, it is teamwork. It is. It cannot be done all by oneself. It was a lot of planning and a bunch of artists, all of us came together and um, I was happy to um, work with them and we created these panels together and put them up. And uh, um, uh, artists and a content writer is a definite must and of course uh, collaborating with a researcher makes a whole big difference. Uh, so um, as everyone says, uh, interpretation is definitely an art and uh, the joy that we see on people's face as they enter the space it's like they enter that white door and they're transformed into a different world um, uh, with large paintings and um, uh, information that they feel like reading or they want to read or um, uh, they um, the way they interact with the panels has been amazing to see and um, i'm glad uh, through art we could make such a difference and uh, many of these children come back again and again to have a look at these, this place and that itself speaks a lot that they have um, they are curious and they want to know more and that is the seed if we can plant the seed of curiosity and that is a big uh, big step towards um, uh, saving or preserving or even uh, trying to coexist uh, learning to coexist with the natural world that we have Thank you very much. Thank you, Sangeeta, for showcasing how art and messaging can play an, a powerful role in the process of interpretation and in the most simplest of ways. Your illustrations and art most definitely showcase a very deep connect. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm uh, going to now uh, pose one question to all the panelists and uh, request for a quick rapid fire answer uh, from everyone. All of you are experienced and veterans in your own field. Uh, what is the one tip that you would give youngsters for, who are applying for this competition? What is that one uh, thing that you would tell us? So we will start with Lima, please. Lima, what is the one tip that you would give uh, for the participants in this competition? Yeah, so uh, my one tip to uh, Whoever is wanting to compete in this Zootopia design is to look at uh, form and make sure that it follows function. That is an architecture principle that also eminently applies to communicate uh, nature, educate, bring about awareness. Uh, when you look at designing for interpretation, you need to understand that you don't underestimate the core value of the exhibit and make sure that it completely communicates what it was meant to be, what it was thought out to be. So you need to plan your exhibit in a way that it communicates what you set out to do in whatever material that you want to do it. And um, also uh, an in interpretation design is this, I want to say that interpretation design is a strategic application of design forms to shape visitor expression. You know, it it does it is not a solo exhibit that you're planning. It has to melt. It has to melt. It has to be uh, congruous uh, and communicate specific ideas, values, and messages. So keep that in mind when you do it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lima. <laughs> Mr. Shukla. One quick yeah. tip for so the, 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 the quick and the only tip is that don't start with designing. Start with looking at nature, start with information that is available to you. And if you get the sense of wonder, if you have your Eureka moment, 
If you fall in love with it, then go for the project. Otherwise, exit. I think it is very uncomplicated domain where you either love it or you don't love it. There's no middle way. So I guess that is the simplest way. And these are young kids. Maybe they can fall in love more easier than all of us. Mm. So I wish them luck. Thank you. Start small and simple. Okay. Kamalika, one tip from you. Yes, um, I will uh, allude a little bit to what Ms., uh, Mr. Shukla already mentioned earlier is that with students in, especially in design and architecture colleges, it's very easy to, you know, form your own team. So right from the uh, time of putting your team together, the composition of uh, your team, you should not, you know, just be a bunch of friends who are students of architecture, or students of exhibition design who get together and send in a proposal. Think through the process of who are all the right ingredients that you need because the, the, pro, the competition is such that you need to not only design, but you also need to develop the uh, program and curate the right um, exhibits that you design for. So we might, uh, every domain will bring its own uh, skill set and therefore the team needs to be interdisciplinary even at the student uh, level. But having said that, it's very easy for design students because this is not so much of a focus of design education is that uh, you 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 kind of obsess more on the design but you, you sometimes you're not culturally linguistically um, and uh, uh, relevant so we need to keep in mind that uh, universal design that it needs to be even disabled friendly that m multiple people in multiple languages need to understand what is being communicated and these are the small things that will make the design uh, really Really relevant and impactful. It's not while yes, good aesthetics and along with robust tech, te tech not tectonics helps you raise the bar and create new benchmarks as an interpretation center. It still needs to be relatable culturally as well as linguistically and for all kinds of uh, and all abilities of people. So when putting the team together and when brainstorming as to what your solution would be, uh, to 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 look uh, consider some of these. Thank you. Thank you. Dipti, one quick tip from you. Yeah, for me, it will be more of sense of place or context. So that comes in two forms. One is the architecture, where Mysore has a very strong heritage and uh, stories and historical backdrop. And the second is about the animals, right? How Sangeeta rightly showed, like showing the habitat of the animals and yeah, the, making it should be like a zone where people forget their uh, where they came from and enter into the zoo. Uh, territory. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Thank yes. you very much, Sangeeta, last words from you. Um, yes, I think um, any day for an artist or an architect, a blank canvas or a blank space can be very intimidating and scary. Um, I think um, it's good to um, go out of the box and uh, go out of your comfort zone and think big and um, go ahead and exp experiment it. Go ahead and uh, have a team to brainstorm and don't be scared. And um, uh, and most of all, as you're doing all this, like try to get to know the animals and the species that you're working uh, with, and that will make a big difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for all your time, valuable insights, personal experiences, and for uh, putting this interpretation center, uh, the ideas, and all forward for the people attending the competition. Uh, thank you again very much. I will now request uh, Gargi to make any housekeeping announcements regarding the competition and for a quick walkthrough. Uh, the presenters, if you have uh, other engagements, you're welcome to leave uh, the meeting. Thank you very much for being here. Gargi, over to you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Uh, I would quickly uh, go through uh, the website. So for the participants, kindly uh, visit aim.gov.in where this is the banner you have for the competition. Once you click the apply now, it will take you to the official page of the competition, you have all the details here, uh, the criteria, the contact details, and you have the three tabs, the competition files, guidelines, and apply now. In the competition files, you will get all the relevant drawings, PDF files, photographs, and a, a master plan uh, DW, uh, DWG file. Uh, in the guidelines, you will have the, uh, the brief, where you have the competition details, what are the requirements you needed to develop this uh, 
this design and uh, in the third tab you have apply now where once you click that apply now there is a tab that will come that will that has two tabs the register so you have to register there and you have to put the category name qualification once you register you can be the uh, of uh, like the formal official uh, participants of this uh, zootopia challenge and through this link you can submit your uh, entries and the final date of the submission is 7th of june at 11:59 pm so please don't be late and kindly send your entries we have only 10 days left uh, going back to the main official website there is a contact details called aim.challenges@gov.in you can send your queries questions you have related to this uh, zootopia competition will be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you. And over to you, Gauri ma'am. Thank you very much everyone for joining us today uh, for our webinar. We look forward to having you uh, again on the third where we will have the last webinar of the series. Um, thank you again and have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you all.